Faculty Seminar of the Presidential Lecture Series at the Philosophy Forum. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Aaron Bigler. He will inaugurate the 2016-17 Presidential Lecture Series. Uh, he is the Sousa Young Gates Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at our neighbor, down south. Uh, Brigham Young University, and he's also the founding director of the uh, Magnetic Resonance Imaging Facility and the Brain Imaging and Behavior Lab. And you will learn a lot more about him this evening at 8 o'clock in the Denison Theater when he will be introduced to uh, talk about brain health, aging, and Alzheimer's. Uh, perspectives from uh, neuroimaging and neuropsychology. His topic this afternoon is uh, neuroimaging perspectives on, uh, on neural connectivity of <laughs> the specter of Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> perspectives on neural connectivity in brain health and brain disease. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Bigger. Well, I'm absolutely delighted and honored uh, to be here. And uh, what, uh, what I really cherish about moments like this uh, are the young people that are just uh, at the beginning of their career. I'm at the end of my career. Uh, I want to make a difference. And I hope that there are some things that I say today that inspire some of you to do research and to do clinical work in uh, brain disorders. And I hope that I can uh, touch some minds and hearts uh, today uh, to pursue this uh, most interesting area. What a magnificent campus you have. That is from, th those two pictures are from my room. Uh, there are not too many people in the world that get to live in such a beautiful setting as you. And uh, uh, it's just been delightful to be here. I need to do a few acknowledgments uh, here because I'm going to be showing you uh, research uh, sponsored uh, by the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Defense. And uh, we have a very large uh, funded uh, program longitudinally examining autism. You're going to see some things about autism uh, today. And these are the different institutions that are involved. I'm very involved in traumatic brain injury. And uh, one of the projects uh, here is with the University of California. Uh, at San Diego, and you can see by the title of this grant project, this is a uh, psychiatric disorder. So new onset psychiatric disorder after head injury. Well, that's something that relates to brain health, and there'll be some more said about that. We have another, uh, several big projects uh, here in combination with uh, Case Western Reserve and Ohio State University on social outcome and also outcome uh, following mild uh, traumatic brain injury. And then this is the chronic effects of neurotrauma consortia. And my lab at BYU does all of the image processing for the structural imaging component of uh, this uh, multi-site consortia of institutions uh, looking at traumatic brain injury. At the end of this project right here, 
will have several thousand uh, uh, soldiers who have had some form of uh, brain injury and or post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's my lab that's doing the structural image analysis that I'll be showing you a little bit later uh, today. And then lastly, this is more for tonight. Um, my lab has done the imaging analysis for the Cache County memory uh, study. Uh, Cache County is one of the northernmost uh, counties in uh, Utah. And in 1992, we received uh, funding uh, to begin this project, which is a longitudinal project, still ongoing today. We evaluated everybody in the county who was 65 and older. Of course, I was in my 40s then. Um, now, uh, I, I would be one of the participants in this uh, study. So it's kind of an interesting thing to be a part of. But um, this study has yielded many, many interesting insights into uh, brain aging, brain health, which I'll talk about tonight. But there is the title, Neuroimaging uh, Methods in the Study of Neural Connectivity in Brain Health and Disease. So brain health and disease. Notice I'm not using the term mental health, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more in just a moment. So uh, this is diffusion tensor uh, imaging. And in diffusion tensor imaging, let me just point out that uh, the colors are not there just to look pretty. The colors are actually telling us about directionality of fiber tracks in the brain. So blue are vertically oriented. And the deeper the blue, the more vertically oriented the fiber track is. Green are anterior, posterior projecting tracks. And the warm colors are side to side. And when you get this deep red uh, here, that is the most lateral movement of these uh, tracks. And notice as this turns here what we can actually see. So when a, uh, a single gyrus has to communicate with another uh, gyrus, that happens by these U fibers. Look at, we can actually see these U fibers in brains. This is my lab director's brain, by the way. So <laughs> any student or uh, person who works with me, and uh, there it is. That is just unbelievably magnificent. We can study the connectivity of the human brain now with imaging tools and techniques. Let's play that one more time. And I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to stop that at a particular point here because I, I want to, oh, I forgot. This one program isn't going to allow me to do that and show this. But uh, when this swings around uh, right here, uh, this right here is a fast pathway. That fast pathway is the pathway associated with emotional control and emotional regulation in the brain. It's a very short pathway. The pathways that are involved in more uh, cognitive processing are typically longer pathways. And we're going to talk some more about that in uh, just a little bit. So why wasn't the term mental health used uh, here? I'm going to do a little historical review because this is very, very important uh, to me. So I'm a psychologist by training. Why is it that I'm not saying that this is mental health? So I want to direct the students here to some very interesting and very important uh, articles. Uh, this uh, entire uh, we're recording this, and I'll turn over the PowerPoint so that you can uh, have access. Uh, this will go to Dr. Hall so you can have access to this. But this is science last year. And notice the author. This is Tom Insel. And I understand Nathan Insel is one of your faculty members. Is, is he here? Nathan, nice to meet you. I understand this is your uncle. True. That is awesome. <laughs> that is just fantastic. So he was the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And this is the article that he wrote as he was stepping down. This is a very, very important article if you're a neuroscience student or a psychology student. If you're interested in the things that I say today, go look at his TED Talk. 
His TED Talk is an amazing TED Talk. Much better than what you're going to get today. Okay, mental disorders, he characterizes it with a question mark. They're common. One in five. Look at those listed there, and that's just a short list. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorder, attention deficit disorder. One in five. Disabling. One in 20. Early onset. Most of these disorders have an onset before age 24. Something is going on in the brain. One in five. Oh my gosh. Let's see, let me look at my family. My brother and sisters, my parents, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, my in-laws. We had those all up. 15 or so people, one in five, three. Yes, in my family, we have bipolar disorder, we have depression, we have autism, we have anxiety disorder, all diagnosed. Yes, these are common problems. They affect us, and I bet if each one in, in this room did that self-analysis, we know this, we know this, but we're not very public about it. So. What did Insul say? I'm going to take just a moment, and if you'll read this with me, because I think this is super important. The field must address the imprecise concepts that constrain both research and practice. Labels like behavioral health disorders, or mental disorders, or the awkwardly euphemistic mental health conditions, when juxtaposed against brain science, invite continual recapitulation of the fruitless mind, body, and nature-nurture debates that have impeded a deep understanding of psychopathology. The brain continually rewires itself and changes gene expression as a function of learning in life. I'm going to show you some scanned findings on that very point in just a few moments. And the brain is organized around tightly regulated circuits. What did you just see? You saw the connectome using diffusion tensor imaging, that impressive spinning brain. Tightly regulated circuits that subserve perception, motivation, cognition, emotion, and social behavior. Thus it, thus it is imperative to include measures of both brain and behavior. This is not a lecture that we shouldn't be studying behavior. We've got to study behavior. We've got to measure behavior in the very best way that we possibly can, but we've got to do it in conjunction with the brain. So brain and behavior to understand the various aspects of dysfunction associated with disorders. Shifting from the language of mental disorders to brain disorders or neural circuit disorders. That's what we're going to be talking about. So this is a shift. And this, again, is back to Insel's presentation. This right here, if we make this shift and we include these disorders, depression, schizophrenia, et cetera, as neurologic disorders, they are the majority of disorders that we have in the world today. This is World Health Organization. So this is incredibly important. So <coughs> I have really been captivated by systems biology. And so there's a recent paper just published in Frontiers in S Systems Neuroscience. So this is open access. You can go to National Library of Medicine, pubmed.gov, and download this article and read it if you want to hear some more about what I'm talking about today. So this is the systems biology uh, approach. The other article is this one right here, published last year in Neuropsychology Review, and it's Structural Image Analysis of the Brain in Neuropsychology Using Magnetic Resonance Imaging Techniques. So it's uh, uh, sort of a tutorial on uh, imaging techniques and how to use them. And so what's important about this systems biology um, is that we have all of this different direction that we can go in. So we, we can't just study behavior anymore. 
we have to study the brain. We have to study systems within the brain. We have to study maps that are within the brain uh, through this uh, 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 neural network uh, approach. But even with this, and I want to stress this point right now, that basically our resolution that I'm going to be showing you today is a cubic millimeter. That's the best resolution. It, it's not the best resolution. We can actually go uh, in the sub-millimeter uh, level, but things get fuzzy. Uh, so what I'm showing you today is one cubic millimeter. Insel, in his presentation, estimates that in one cubic millimeter, 80,000 neurons, four and a half billion synapses. Amazing complexity. But unless we address this both from a bottom up and a top down in integrating behavior with networks, et cetera, we're going to have a very incomplete picture. But we can start to get at that with imaging. So this is a uh, a, a child with a significant brain injury. And you can see there is a divot missing in this child's brain. And this is a child that has significant social-emotional problems because of this uh, frontal lobe damage. But it's not just frontal lobe damage. There's other damaged areas in the brain. So we can get at the tissue level. And that's a whole nother lecture, because you can see this little white thing right here. That's telling us that the myelin in the brain is particularly uh, uh, affected uh, there. There's also uh, some other aspects of this that tell me that the vascular system is uh, affected here. And then, of course, we can see this big structural defect. So we can get at the tissue level. We can also get at the organ level, the overall organ level. And we can also get at function of the brain through uh, functional uh, MRI. But this is a lecture on supposed mental health, but I'm not using that word. I'm using brain health. So I like to put this in historical perspective because, again, the young people in this audience, you're on the precipice of unbelievable technology to study the human brain that we've never, ever had before. When I, I got my PhD in 1974, and immediately started a postdoc. In 1974, we could do skull x-ray, and we could do this technique down here that's called pneumoencephalography. Pneumoencephalography was putting a catheter into the uh, base of the spinal column uh, and withdrawing cerebral spinal fluid and replacing it with air. So that's air in the ventricle that you're seeing there. And it's basically this skull x-ray. That's what we had in 1974. This is the beginning of CT imaging, which I'm going to show in just a moment. This is what we can do now with CT imaging. This is the beginning of uh, MRI. This is the first published MRI uh, scan. This is early 1980s. This MRI is my lab director again, um, uh, down at our uh, facility. And we're going to look at that brain uh, a little more uh, later on. So again, to put this in perspective, you see what I look like today? Uh, that's, that's what I look like uh, when I was a postdoc. Um, so guess what? Everyone is going to age in this room. So we should be very interested in what our brain is doing in this aging process. But uh, this is what changed my life. This is 1975. I was there as a, a postdoc. I had every intention to be doing exactly what Dr. Insel is doing right now. I wanted to be Dr. Insel back then. I was there to do a neurophysiology postdoc. But this came. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh my gosh, I can see pathology in a patient. And now I can apply behavioral techniques to study what damage dysfunction I can see in the brain. So it's now a challenge to quantify what it is that we're looking at. So this is Barrow Neurological uh, Institute when I was there. Uh, that's a 19, 1958 Impala. <laughs> Man, if you had that back then, <laughs> woo! 
So, but here's the challenge, because some of the things that I've said to this point in time may raise the hair on the back of your neck for some of you, like, oh my gosh, you can't diss psychology. Don't, wait a minute, we, all of these things are so important. Every time there's a technology change, there's a challenge. Look at this. So here we're getting a lecture on imaging. This is New England Journal of Medicine. New England Journal of Medicine, 1976. So uh, uh, this fellow here is the chair of radiology at, the, uh, at Mass General. So notice the title to this. This is, com uh, it used to be called computerized axial tomography, and that's where the CAT scan came from. So uh, uh, this became a very big challenge, and look what is said, cat fever is a new disease entity that has a broad clinical spectrum. The predominant symptom appears as a feverish impulse to own, operate, exploit, or write about something that's cat. And cat fever, like many diseases infecting the medical literature, is transmitted largely through self-perpetuating myths. So what did Dr. Shapiro want us to do in 1976? Throw out CT imaging. This is some kind of computerized reconstruction of the brain. It's not the real brain, it's a, it's a reconstruction. It's like an artist. We, we, we can't accept this. This is, this is not real science. What, what, is, what is this stuff? Well, it's a good thing we didn't do that because look at where we are now. So what else happens in 1976, 1977? So this is when I finished my postdoc. I finished my postdoc in 77. And uh, I joined the faculty at the University of uh, Texas and uh, 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 had the opportunity to set up uh, the clinical neuropsychology service at uh, Brackenridge Hospital, the city hospital uh, there. And uh, also, I set up the first uh, clinical neuropsychology assessment lab for the State Department of Mental Health and Mental Retardation in Texas. And I did it at this, oh, wait a minute, the State Lunatic Asylum? That's what it was called, okay? 50 years before I arrived there, that's what Austin State Hospital was called. That was the official title of that facility. The official title, the State Lunatic Asylum. Wow. And you all recognize that individual. So I had the great fortune of Dr. Hall uh, being a graduate uh, student there. He may have started the program in 83, so I may have my, my date uh, incorrect. But uh, uh, Stuart uh, uh, worked for me, uh, did assessments uh, here and at Brackenridge and, and the other hospitals that we were involved in at that point in time, and uh, was just a, an absolutely remarkable student. So, since we're talking about psychiatric disorders, let's go back in time. This is my introductory psychology textbook from 1965. And uh, look what it says here. The schizophrenic is an individual with an ego that has broken down and retreated from reality. Hmm. So, now, Dr. Hall started as an undergraduate at the University of Texas in 78, right? So this is what Dr. Hall was taught when he was an undergraduate student. This was a prevailing theory, even though there were all kinds of studies that told us that something was going on in the brain that was related to schizophrenia. And then this all started to change in 1976. So this is the first study that actually took computed tomography and looked at a brain structure, in this case the ventricle, the internal cavity of the brain, and measured it. And you can see this uh, scattergram uh, uh, here, that these are the controls, and these are the individuals with schizophrenia, and there's certainly an overlap. Not everyone with schizophrenia had large ventricles, but Many of them did, and there's a very interesting thing. Look at it at the top here. You probably can't see that at the back. 
That says lacotomized. Lacotomized? What in the world is lacotomized? Well, leucotomy was a form of brain surgery like a frontal lobotomy. It was cutting the white matter pathways in the frontal area of the brain. Well, notice the ones who were lacotomized. Those, are, those were the ones that had uh, surgery because they had a very severe form of this illness. And they're the ones that form the majority of those who have the largest ventricles. Something was wrong with the brain. Now, this article was highly criticized by prevailing theory at the time. How could this be that it's related to the brain? How could it be? Well, there's another very interesting story that's going on at Austin State Hospital when Dr. Hall was there, and that's this brain collection. So I had this great privilege of working with a neuropathologist. At that point in time, anyone who passed away in the state hospital or state school system had to have an autopsy, and that had to include the brain. And Dr. Deshenar was the neuropathologist, and I got to work uh, with him. And one day, we had this patient who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Later onset, though, it was kind of unusual. This fellow was older, and most of the time, schizophrenia has an earlier onset. And he had all the classic features of schizophrenia. But in the midst of our assessment of him in the neuropsychology lab, he had a seizure, went into status epilepticus, and died. So he went to autopsy. And I thought, oh my gosh, I had just seen this report that we looked at here. This is going to be fantastic because here we're going to have a post-mortem brain that we're going to be able to look at. We're going to be able to look at the ventricle because this is still uh, uh, very, very early. Uh, we had just gotten our first CT scanner in Austin. And Dr. Deshenar takes out the brain, and you could immediately see there was a tumor. There was a tumor in the frontal part of the brain. Where were the leucotomized patients? Where was that transection done? In the frontal part of the brain. Well, maybe we should start thinking about brain disorders in schizophrenia. And just parenthetically, what this down here shows, uh, uh, this is what uh, glioblastoma multiforme looks like in contemporary imaging, unmistakable pathology. But this was in this uh, patient. So one of the uh, first grant projects that I was able to get involved in was actually CT imaging of uh, schizophrenia. And so this is CT imaging of schizophrenia. Uh, 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 these are a couple of the publications from the 1980s. But this is a very dramatic case uh, here uh, that occurred years ago when I first came to BYU. I came to BYU in 1990, and this is a case that we had right after I came uh, to the university. So this is what's called the T2-weighted uh, MRI scan, and you're looking at the ventricle. That, uh, the T2-weighted scan is very sensitive to cerebral spinal fluid. So you can see uh, th this cavity here is very large in comparison to what it should look like. But interestingly, look at this. It's also very prominent across the frontal part of the brain. So what we now know is that schizophrenia is clearly a brain disease. It predominantly affects frontal and temporal areas. There's enlargement in the ventricular system, and we should be doing imaging studies in patients with schizophrenia to understand this disorder. So this is a 2016 study, and we'll just jump to this right here. What this is is called voxel-based morphometry. So what you're doing is you're comparing voxels uh, between uh, healthy controls that are age-matched and sex-matched, and you're looking at where the differences are, and it takes uh, no imagination to see that where these greatest differences occur predominate in frontal and temporal areas uh, of the brain. It's a brain disorder. If we're going to understand schizophrenia, we've got to understand it from a brain health 
uh, perspective. So, brain disorders, precisely. The other thing that Dr. Insull is trying to get across here, the precisely term is for precision medicine. It's to go into the individual so that we understand the individual and we understand what's happening with that individual and we can be predictive about what's going on. So let's shift gears to another, in quotes, with question mark, mental health disorder, autism. So this is Leo Kanner's original uh, publication. This is 1943, isn't it? Yeah, 1943. So 1943, Leo Kanner, psychiatrist uh, at Hopkins, uh, publishes the classic paper that defines uh, this disorder. And interestingly, in his conclusion, he says that it's inborn. This is an inborn disturbance. Well, to me, inborn signifies something that must be biological, something biologically driven. He also reported some very interesting things that we're going to look at here in just a little bit. That there were some motor skill differences in his sample that he referred to as being autistic. And there was also another very fascinating thing that a uh, greater than uh, normal distribution in head size. Hmm. Head size? Brain size? Okay, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. So, um, back to this book of, of mine in uh, beginning uh, psychology in the 1960s. So, Kanner is acknowledged here, but this is the definition of autism. Imaginary gratification of desires in fantasy as uh, contrasted with realistic attempts to gratify them. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> what were we doing uh, back there trying to understand this? So, what we've discovered here is this very, very interesting thing. And it almost doesn't matter what system we look at. There's this very fascinating mismatch. So there's a size function rule in the brain. The brain reaches an optimal size that in turn relates to certain aspects of function. So if you measure the auditory cortex area of the brain, in the superior temporal gyrus, that's this gyrus right here, and auditory cortex is in this internal area here. If you measure that area, you can calculate a volume, and there's an interesting relationship between the volume of that area and language function, and it's somewhat linear. Here are the controls, right here. In autism, that size function rule falls apart. So the brain doesn't develop in this normal size function kind of uh, relationship uh, that we uh, typically see. You can do this with uh, motor cortex. Uh, you can do this uh, with other areas of the brain. And we see similar relations. What about brain development? So this is a study we published a few years ago. I think it's 19, or, uh, 2014 in brain. This is uh, our autism study, which is a large cohort of individuals who were tracking over time. So we started this in the mid-1990s. Uh, some of our participants were as young as three years of age at that point in time, about the time when you can reliably diagnose uh, autism, and track them now to 2017. We, this grant was just renewed. Um, so we're going to get uh, another date, one or two data points uh, here. Wonderful sample size, magnificent distribution across the age uh, span. And look at this. This is so interesting to me. So when we look at this from a group data standpoint, so the autism group has a bigger brain. So you may have seen some of the literature on this, that there is a potential overgrowth that happens. And what do we know is important in the brain? Pruning. That the brain, you actually come into this world probably with more cells than what you need, and there needs to be some pruning and honing in of pathways and tracts and cells, et cetera. And it's okay to lose a few. So there's, there's a difference here 
but then the trajectory over time changes. And one of the things that we think may also be going on here is that in autism, there's a lot of repetitive behavior. Well, repetitive behavior doesn't stimulate necessarily uh, new pathways to grow and develop it. It may enhance existing pathways, but it doesn't stimulate new pathways. And this may be what's occurring here. But also, look, look here. There are differences in motor cortex. There are differences in other areas that are developmentally mediated. So here is the mix of behavior and brain. This is what we need to do, in my humble opinion, as sort of the roadmap for the future of psychology, neuropsychology, behavioral science, is this kind of format here. So this is uh, manual uh, motor uh, development. And so some very simple measurements, grip strength, finger tapping uh, uh, speed uh, here. The black lines are typical developing, blue lines are the autism spectrum cohort. And look at this separation again. There are significant motor findings. Canner mentioned motor deficits in 1943, and this was basically ignored until just recently. And if we now approach this from a brain standpoint, there are differences in the tracks of the motor system, and in particular, differences in the motor track integrity at the midbrain and upper brainstem level. Now, when we think about that from a cognitive standpoint, what cognitive tests, I'm going to put Dr. Hall on, I, I love, love to have him in the classroom because I love to put him on the spot. So let's put Dr. Hall on the spot. What, tell me the neuropsychological test that we use for brainstem assessment. Brainstem assessment? See, we don't have one. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Cranial nerve. <laughs> Cranial nerve. But those pathways are also tracking information that we do something with from a cognitive, sensory, integration, language standpoint. And we don't have ways of, assess, uh, of assessing this except through imaging. So we can uh, assess this from a functional MRI. This is activation simply by doing that finger motion uh, here. So this is motor cortex. And this is, this is a diffusion tensor imaging look at the, looking at the cortical spinal tract. So we can now image the brain. We can use these behavioral tests. And we can see, in fact, what is happening at the brain level. I'm going to skip that. So um, surely, surely, if we're talking about traumatic brain injury, there was this complete understanding that if you had a traumatic brain injury, it was going to change behavior and affect the person psychologically. Right? I mean, it just, it's got to be. So you probably can't see this at the back, but this is not a, this, so I have this uh, when, when I'm born. So this is in the late 1940s. Um, this is the abnormal psychology textbook. It, it was the most popular textbook of the time. Notice the title, not quite uh, politically correct. A clinical approach in psychological deviance. So how would you like to take that uh, class in psychology at the University of Montana, and it's titled Psychological Deviance? Um, maybe, maybe not a politically correct thing uh, to do. So what does this book say about Traumatic brain in head injuries and gunshot wounds involving damage to the brain occasionally produce mental disturbances, but such injuries are not an important cause of mental disease. Wow. Well, now think about it. If, if your theories were not theories that were based in the brain, then why would brain damage cause any particular problems? So what is our huge issue right now? In terms of our military, suicides. What's the huge issue in the military? Mild traumatic brain injury, post-concussion disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, other stress-related problems. Wow. 
We've got to understand the brain better. And we won't show uh, this, but you can probably guess what my feelings are about football and head injury. So, um, so the roadmaps to brain behavior relations via neuroimaging is through different kinds of MRI uh, techniques. And if we look at this uh, little plot uh, here, and we look at neuroimaging and neuropsychology, almost nothing until close to the end of the 20th century. And with the beginning of the 21st century, now we see this huge uh, uptick. And that's because we have technology. So this is my brain. This is my brain. So when was the last time you were in a classroom and you got to see your professor's brain? Maybe today. So, look at that. So this is three Tesla imaging. This is a particular imaging sequence that gives you this really nice view. It's called a true inversion recovery sequence. But here is the thalamus. This is the caudate. You can see the ventricle. You can see the white matter, gray matter. You can see the cortical ribbon here. Unbelievable. But for me, as a psychologist, one of the things that psychologists want to do, we want to measure things. If you've taken a class from Dr. Hall, he, you know he wants to measure things. He wants to know a mean and a standard deviation. He wants to know a distribution. That's what we do in psychology. We want to know those things. So we shouldn't just look at this and be in awe that that's a neat looking image of the brain. We want to measure it. Well, there's some really nice things about the brain from an image quantification standpoint. And that is, so here is uh, uh, a, a different level of that brain. And so here's white matter, gray matter. That is an image contrast on a gray scale, correct? Straightforward. So you do a thresholding type of a technique, and you can separate out the white matter from the gray matter. And you can also see some of the uh, this is the dura mater up here. So you can see some of the meninges. You got to take that out. So uh, we have to do these different techniques that extract this information out. And then uh, we can then classify the image. So this is what's called thresholding and segmentation. And then this is uh, uh, classification. So now we're classifying these different areas uh, here in the brain. And they get this uh, nice little uh, color coding. We can take this information now, and this is a very busy slide, but what this slide is basically telling you is that we can, with imaging technology techniques, look at feature aspects in the image and extract this information out in a quantitative way. And that quantitative way then allows us to do a host of image analysis techniques starting with the standard structural image, where we can go into volumetric diffusion tensor network, what's called resting state. From, the, from all of these different things, we can develop connectivity matrices. These connectivity matrices are very straightforward, but potentially very powerful in understanding uh, brain and behavior problems. So for, for example, in this resting state right here that you can see, this resting state uh, shows this is the blood oxygen level uh, signal. It almost looks like an EEG. Uh, and you can see th uh, that it lights up similarly in both occipital poles. Well, if those areas are lighting up uh, in, in some uniform way, they must be connected. And so we have ways of measuring uh, this and setting up a matrix where you pit one side of the brain to the other side of the brain and then you look at how connected those are. And you can do that with resting state. You can do that with structural imaging. You can do it with uh, DTI. And then you can develop these network plots, as you see right here. And what's going to happen in the future is something along these lines. So in clinical neuropsychology, you're going to start in another few years, you're going to start seeing these kind of analyses, because one side is the left hemisphere, the other side is the right hemisphere. 
And each of these layers in that circle is telling you something about structure, integrity, and connectivity uh, with the other regions of the brain. And the key here is to automate this. But I mentioned earlier, uh, and Insel said this, that the brain is always changing. So here is uh, some uh, work. Uh, this is actually me uh, down here. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're getting in the scanner and running an identical sequence but then waiting a period of time and running the exact same sequence. Now the equipment doesn't change, the program doesn't change, nothing changes except time. And so if you analyze the same scan, uh, so you're not doing a different scan, so this is the same scan, you get this nice linear relationship when you're looking at signal intensity. What you're looking at in MRI is a, a radio frequency signal. Uh, but uh, if you're imaged in a different scanner or if you're the same subject in the same scanner with the same protocol done, the signal intensities change. And part of that is the inherent physiologic noise that's occurring every moment. So we can go into, and I, I, I'm going to run over the 45 minutes, just a few minutes here, but just bear with me. I just for, so if you haven't seen this, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this uh, scan uh, here and it's going to show you the capabilities uh, that we uh, actually have. And uh, if you haven't seen this, and I know many of you have, but if you haven't seen this, I think it's just very impressive to take a look at this. So what we're going to do, these are what are called DICOM files. This is how the image comes. And I'm going to take a T1 and a T2 flare and just a standard uh, T2 uh, here. And I'm going to link them. So now they're linked. And look at, wow, isn't that amazing? Let's make these brains all about the same size so that So any structure you want to see go into, we can go there. We can also go into this with what's called a multiplanar perspective. So here is the multiplanar uh, perspective and just have to reorient these. And uh, so watch over here. These are telling you the different planes. So this is the axial plane. Uh, this one over here, I'm going to make this image bigger, this bigger, and this bigger here. And so you can see the bar, the red bar moving up and down. We can go anywhere in the brain. We can identify any structure that we want to and show it now in 3D. So this is my brain again. This is a post-mortem brain, not mine, not, not yet. <laughs> but let me tell you what I've done. Uh, in my will, I've modified my will because I've done so many scans of my brain over the years that uh, when I pass, my brain is going to be frozen and sectioned. And it's going to be integrated with the imaging analyses that I've done on my very own brain. So the young students here, when you become a professor in the future, look up Aaron Bigler in 20 years or so. <laughs> and you'll be able to give a lecture using my brain, and you can tell your students you actually saw me live. <laughs> and I'm 100% I'm, I'm serious about that. Whoops, this is not the one that I wanted. So, so here's, here's me. So now we're doing a simple cut down. And there is my brain. So that is not only my brain there, but in my little bag. 
here is my brain. So this is a 3D printed model of my brain. You can come up and look at it and hold it. Whatever you'd like to do with my brain, <laughs> you can do with my brain at the end of the lecture. I'll put it up here. But that is my brain. I'm holding my brain. What did, what did Hamlet say? <laughs> York? No, I, I won't do that. So, um, so we can show this in 3D. And not only that, but we've developed this interactive program here. And this is part of what we're doing in that Chronic Effects of Neurotrauma Consortia for the precision medicine, the individualized medicine approach, so that in every patient, so here is my head, every patient we can see the brain. So there is my brain color-coded, and here is that brain uh, quantified. So if I click on there, that tells me that that's the superior temporal uh, gyrus, and that's what is highlighted uh, right there. And I'm going to show you in a moment, it goes to a different page where we have quantification. So this is the white matter of the brain. This is uh, a view where we uh, have a clear shot through the brain looking at subcortical areas. And then here are the subcortical areas. So now I can study my own hippocampus. And I'll have more to say about this tonight in the lecture uh, because this is a critical structure in aging and Alzheimer's uh, disease. But notice I'm controlling that. I'm controlling all of this with the mouse. And I can make this completely uh, interactive. And I can uh, quantify everything that you see here. And I want to show you this right here, because this one is uh, in particularly uh, an impressive uh, view, in my opinion. So what I've done is you're looking at the medial surface of the right hemisphere, and we've pulled off all of the left hemisphere. So this is the ventricle. This is uh, the caudate. This is the putamen. This is the thalamus back here. And the blue is the ventricle. And this is uh, the hippocampus. And this is the amygdala. Uh, but I want to show you something that gets us into a lot of trouble. This area right here, see this little area right there? Let me blow that up so you can look at that. That is a very small area. It sits at the base of the caudate. That's the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is the reward center in the brain. It's no bigger than your little pinky. But what happens in addiction? This lights up. Okay, This area right here is a huge problem area for us in terms of brain health because of how it relates to reward, addiction, positive valence kinds of things. It also probably is on the negative valence of things as well. But that's a different uh, uh, lecture. So we can image all of these areas. And then, as we saw before, uh, maybe we could turn the light off on this then. This will show up better if we go dark here. See, that's better. And just think of this. These are frontal pathways here. That's that quick emotional circuit. Look at the long pathways here from your parietal cortex to your frontal cortex that guide certain aspects of attention and goal-directed uh, behaviors. Uh, so that's diffusion tensor uh, imaging. OK, we can turn the light back on. So that's that unsolent fasciculus. This is this child with significant uh, frontal lobe uh, damage, as you can uh, see here. But it's not so much that it's this damage that you see right here is how it affects these networks. These are different networks in the brain. So it's how it affects these networks. And we look at how this network damage 
is uh, affected in this uh, child and how this network damage then rela relates to all of these different aspects of what we can do in uh, imaging from structural to functional uh, imaging. But it's connectivity that's the key. Let me show you this. This is magnetoencephalography. So this is Eric Hallgren who uh, was at the University of Utah. He's now part of the UCSD uh, program of research that we're in. So this is reading a novel word. This, all, all that this subject is doing is reading a novel word. So you have to flash a novel word for uh, about a second and a half, and then this individual has to, in quotes, read the word. And you see activation exactly like you would expect. Occipital pole activates. And for those that have been in the behavioral neuroscience uh, class that you have, you know there's a dorsal stream. You know there's a ventral stream. It's telling you something about uh, what and where and what's going on and how it taps into language. So this is going into attention networks. This is going into language networks. Now remember, this individual has to say, has to repeat the word that they have just been flashed. Aha! Look at the language areas are engaging and all of a sudden we've tapped into frontal cortex because this is speech area, Broca's area. We've got to be able to say and communicate this at 170 milliseconds. Holy moly! So if we're not measuring things in milliseconds and we're not integrating this with some kind of brain imaging methodology, electrophysiology, uh, uh, functional imaging, how are we going to understand this? How are we going to get at this? This is happening in very fast time, very fast uh, epic, epochs. And so now it's, I've run out of time here, so I'm going to switch to this. So it's at about this point that the person's about ready to speak and say something, and somewhere in this time frame here, the person's able to respond. So lots of things are happening in the brain before we're actually at a behavior that we can measure. So we've got to be able to get at this. So we've got to move into precision psychology, precision brain health. And I'm going to skip this to, if we can go back to the lights, and this will be the last thing that I'll do because I've woefully run out of time. So this is what we're doing now in the precision medicine with our chronic effects of neurotrauma consortia. This is a patient with blast injury who has a significant residual uh, uh, problem with a variety of symptoms and cognitive deficits. This is a white matter hyperintensity uh, right here. So we're going to uh, try to study that white matter hyperintensity as best we can. We can create a little movie file here so you can see uh, these classified images down here and up here you're going to see some red. The red identifies where that lesion is. You'll see those lesions also identified in this when we get to it. So here is this patient's brain. Everything is quantified. I'm going to strip off the gray matter. There is the white matter. I'm going to go to subcortical areas, and that's now going to show you where these different lesions are. But I want to know where those lesions are in the white matter. So these are the different white matter areas where those lesions and uh, pathologies uh, reside uh, in this uh, brain. So what do we do with this? We take it to this particular step here. So this is a simple Excel spreadsheet. Notice down here, this is at three standard deviations. So there's only a few that are showing differences at three standard deviations. So let's turn it to two, and we'll uh, switch uh, this, and we'll see uh, there's a few more. Let's switch it to one standard deviation, and you'll see that there's uh, many more. But let's put it into an integrated way where uh, we're going to show that. So now we're going to show that uh, here. So uh, remember, there were just a few uh, that uh, showed up um, at three standard deviations. So now, uh, here we are at one standard deviation. So it's ventricle, 
and uh, several subcortical structures. Uh, at two standard deviations, it's just the putamen and the uh, ventricle and the white matter hyperintensities. At three standard deviations, it's just the ventricular system and the white matter uh, hyperintensities. So for each patient, we're able to uh, show uh, quantitatively where the pathology is and compare it to a normative sample that's matched for age and uh, sex. I direct your attention to this NIH uh, section. Notice what it's called. Quantitative Imaging and Tissue Sciences, Behavioral Determinants and Developmental Imaging. That is the future, in my opinion. And so we have this magnificent brain. Here is my brain. Um, we can now study this in the walking, talking. Let me get my perspective just right. Look at this. I can put it up like. So we can do this now. So as individuals interested in behavior, we need to study behavior and brain together. Thank you. Yes. You shared the history of progress in the scans over the last 40 years or so with us. What can we foresee in the future? What do we know about how much greater resolution should be possible? What barriers there are? What, what inherent limits there may be? And, and how important is it for understanding brain health and disease or other aspects of cognitive function, uh, like emotions or language, uh, or working on artificial intelligence? So um, artificial intelligence first, I think as we understand artificial intelligence, we'll hopefully understand a little bit better about what actually is going on uh, from uh, the brain uh, perspective. In terms of technology, I anticipate that it will only get uh, better and we'll be able, we, you can do submillimeter uh, uh, imaging. Uh, you just have to do many repeat scans. And so it's not really practical um, with the three Tesla uh, apparatus that uh, we have. There are higher Tesla machines out there now. Seven Tesla is approved for clinical use and human use uh, now. And you can go into the submillimeter uh, range uh, with that. Um, People are working on ligands for uh, MR. They have them for PET, so we can image uh, amyloid, for example. Uh, we can image other aspects of pathologic conditions in the brain. PET imaging is an expensive tool, though, uh, and uh, MR is, is uh, probably better equipped because it's not using radiation uh, uh, if uh, certain ligands. Uh, uh, can be uh, developed that are sensitive to either neurotransmitters or some disease process or something along those lines. Um, I, I was talking with other faculty uh, members earlier uh, today. I, that, that scanner that I showed you that uh, changed my life, uh, that was a dedicated head scanner. The first CT scanners that came out, you could not do a body in that. You only could do the head. Uh, I actually think that's going to come back in the next uh, decade. I think there will be a, a dedicated MR scanner. Uh, it may actually be a lower field uh, scanner uh, because some of the things that may be of greatest interest to us at the behavioral level. Let me just switch back to um, one slide that I had right at the beginning. Some of, some of what we may need to know and that may be most predictive of uh, some of the neurologic and neuropsychiatric disorders may be happening at this level right here, which we can get at uh, quite well. Uh, now, uh, you have faculty members here that are working on blood biomarkers. Blood biomarkers are telling us something that are happening uh, more at this level. So it may be that we're integrating a biomarker that's at this level that's telling us something more about the systems level 
And that integration may be absolutely critical. And so that's where this basic research comes into play that may uh, change the world for us clinically. Yes? I'd like to follow up on uh, Ross's question. Um, and let me first uh, uh, express my admiration and agreement with uh, what you have presented. So it's pushing ahead, as, as Ross was suggesting. And it seems to me that from what you say and what's sort of reflected in this uh, order of uh, approaches is that we're caught between very coarse grading and very fine grading. Mm -hmm. So from what goes on in the brain, you know, when a person talks and, or even analyzes a, a, a novel word, is so fine grained that it sort of escapes the coarse grain, and the small grain isn't helpful enough, like you know, giving a letter of one word. Right. And the problem that I see, which may be uh, an unwarranted apprehension, is that there's just too much, you know? So if the brain works holistically, and a lot of the brain comes into play when a person looks at a novel word and says, so what's the etymology? What would it, what was it first used? And what does it sound like? And what's a, what are the cognates and so on? Yeah. You know, a lot of the brain may come into play. And so that could be, I mean, uh, millions, hundreds of millions of neurons. I'm sure that it is. And, and uh, so how do you track them? So um, that is going to be an amazing challenge. I'm, I'm going to show two slides from tonight, okay? Because it, it, gets, it gets to um, what, so the first thing is we have to study this from a lifespan standpoint. So we, we can't, we, we, in psychology we have tended to Okay, our group is 21 to 25 year olds, and then we study that, and we don't study it over a lifespan. We, we really have to study lifespan. But then we have to do this thing right here. So, uh, let's see, let me show. So you're going to see that I talk about some of the same things here. But it's relevant. So this is a couple of really fascinating aspects about the brain. So that the head can make it down the birth canal, it has to be small. So when you come into this world, uh, y you have a 300 to 600 cc uh, brain uh, volume. But look what happens at age four. You almost have an adult-sized brain. So you have this incredibly complex network that you're talking about that just develops. But it develops in what I like to call an experience-dependent environment setting. Remember what Insel showed us? that most of these brain health disorders occur before age 20, 24? Well, if we look at this, that is when the brain is developing. Uh, and it's developing at an incredible rate. And then, as I alluded to, a very interesting thing happens. This is gray matter, this is white matter. Gray matter reaches this early peak, and then look what happens. Pruning takes place. And so if you're going to go from uh, Missoula to Bozeman, what, do you, what road do you take? What, what is it? OK, what's the alternate? Yeah. You still get there, right? Yeah, you'll still get there. OK. so. Br the brain does exactly the same thing. It prunes to, toward efficiency, but then it has also a backup system. 
And that's what's, that's what's happening here. But look what happens with myelin and connectivity in the brain. It gets better, and it increases. So we lose brain cells, but we increase in connectivity. And that is tied into this pruning process and this learning process and this developmental uh, process. Well, potentially tracking some of these things over time may really help us understand developmental disorders, learning disability, autism, and uh, maybe ways that we could intervene. But I agree with you, this is a daunting task for our fine, I mean, how can our brain, I know this is uh, philosophy uh, here, so uh, this has been one of our challenges, how can our finite brain uh, understand our own brain? I mean, how, 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 does, that, how does that happen? So, <laughs> it just does happen. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think, uh, for me, part of this message right here is the critical time frame for us in terms of brain health is actually <laughs> very early in life. And that's probably where we need to be putting most of our resources is in this early brain development and not waiting for something to happen. Yes? So I think this is going to add to your talk tonight when you're talking about stress hormones. Yeah, absolutely. The stress hormones that occur during that pruning event, right, can predispose a person for uh, adult uh, neuro neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, for example. So in our Cache County, so there's so much to cover, I, I, I don't have time, but in our Cache County um, uh, study, uh, if uh, you were uh, neglected, uh, abused as a child, that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease later in life. Um, and so, yes, these stress hormones, I mean, uh, you don't have to come to the lecture uh, tonight, I can give you a very simple uh, response. Uh, good nutrition, good health, good social-emotional uh, balance, avoid things that we know that are bad uh, for the body and the brain. Those are all potential risk factors for uh, aging and Alzheimer's disease. Sleep disturbance, anxiety disorder. So what we need to do, uh, w w what we know now is if if these things are showing up right here, we need to be effective in treatment at this point in time. We need to use behavioral intervention techniques because that's all we have at this point in time. We don't have a medication that helps us. We've got to do something here at this point in time to change that trajectory. But that trajectory probably gets set early. You had a question. So um, you talked about how the CT or CAT scanning first came about, it was met with kind of skepticism. Is that same sort of attitude happening now with this new explosion of imaging? Oh, absolutely. In, in, in fact, uh, I get hate mail occasionally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Do you think that, that you know, it's like whenever there's something new that opens up things, it, it's kind of healthy to think a little bit of skepticism. How do we find that middle ground? So, so science only gets better with skepticism. Yeah. So, so you, need, you need to be challenged. You, 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 need, to, you need to have the naysayers. I, so my point is not, not that. I, I, I want those challenges. And you may have seen uh, there's, there was a, there's a huge problem with functional MRI. There was a very prominent paper published just a few months ago uh, about using some of the canned uh, routine uh, image analysis post-processing uh, techniques that artificially uh, inflate significance. So uh, many of the uh, fMRI studies, uh, if they didn't use the right analysis, uh, they've published results that are garbage. And you know, what happened early on with fMRI is everybody got all excited about, oh, well, we can do this program and we can do this technique and we have all these simple ways of analyzing it and so you get all kinds of things, you know, from 
trying to identify who's a Democrat and who's a Republican and, you know, by brain activation and those kinds of things. And most of that research is probably worthless um, that, that was published prior to 2015. Um, so, uh, so because you have so many potential combinations of clusters where you can identify changes and you have to also identify the, the size of the cluster that you're looking at, if it's not done properly, you get inflated findings that aren't genuine. Please. Quick follow up. So, how do we avoid that? Learn, learn your neuroscience and learn how to do image analysis properly. Get an MRI machine here at the University of Montana so that you can do your own MRI work right here. It's prime. Yes. I was curious, uh, how do they rate the health of your brain? <laughs> well, uh, now, w one, of the, one of the things about uh, skepticism, as long as it's skepticism not involving me directly, uh, then I usually accept it. But no, my, um, so my brain uh, actually uh, has uh, a, a fair amount of atrophy. Uh, I'm going to be 68, and uh, this is the inner hemispheric fissure. If uh, I show you, uh, this is for tonight's lecture. Uh, uh, this is a child's uh, brain who's had a brain injury, and you can see there's a frontal defect right here. Look at his inner hemispheric fissure where my finger's pointing right here. It's very tight because when the brain first develops, it fills the cranial vault and there's very little uh, cortical cerebral spinal fluid. Look at that sucker. <laughs> so it's atrophied. Um, but I know that's part of normal aging. And, uh, but I've been doing my MRI scan uh, since I was 40, um, where I could actually record it. Stuart and I were talking about this before. In the early days of imaging, there was not a file system to actually save the files in a way that you could actually use them. Uh, and so they had to be saved on the mainframe, which made it impossible to transfer data and things. So I don't have any of my really early scans. But from the time I was about 40, when we started to have these DICOM files that were transferable and et cetera, that we could put on a floppy and you know, now we can just transfer electronically, um, I've lost about 80 cc's of brain tissue. Ooh. Uh, let's go back to one thing here. Where did I have that? It was Insel's quote. Well, I may. Anyway, you saw, you know, 80,000 neurons per cubic millimeter. Well, I just said not cubic millimeter. I said cubic centimeter. <laughs> so how many millions of neurons have I lost? A lot. But that's why, that's why I, I, I brought up the redundant way uh, to get to Helena or Bozeman or uh, wherever. You have redundant systems that are somewhat backup systems that you know, help us with the aging process. But the thing that this, I can't run as fast. I can't do things as fast as I did when I was a young man. When I was talking with the students earlier, so I want somebody to name who's the 45-year-old catcher in the major leagues. Who's the 45-year-old catcher in the major leagues? <laughs> you don't know because there is none. <laughs> you cannot be a catcher because that ball is coming 100 miles an hour, and you have to work with this incredible millisecond precision to be uh, in that particular game. You, the, with that that I was just showing you there, as the brain changes with the aging process, things slow down. So. Yes? I have a follow-up question uh, for what Rebecca was. The only other licensed person is 
our uh, overall principal investigator, Janet Lanehart. She's a pediatrician psychiatrist. We're the only licensed people on that entire research team for uh, doing this autism uh, uh, work. Uh, the rest are MR physicists, engineers, uh, statisticians, uh, informatics uh, people, data management uh, uh, people, and you, you've, you've got to have that research uh, uh, team because not one person can do this kind of research anymore. It may take someone that has some multiple layers of some skill levels to, to bring it together, but the, the analysis of these programs, these programs are really complex. The imaging quality and what you're looking at voxel by voxel and all of that kind of stuff, that requires special training. I have a lab director that's got 26 years of experience of uh, looking at this uh, stuff. I trust him. I can't do it. It takes a team. This is not something you can do by yourself. And I'm sorry, the second part of your question was? Uh, the second part, um, in view of you know, the pressure on researchers to publish, you know, to, you know, to acquire funding, um, like, like how do we deal with the issue of false positives and trying to avoid false positives and trying not to rush research in view of like, the, the funding issue? So uh, another outstanding question. You may have seen the science article a couple of years ago that looked at uh, replication of some of the major papers in uh, psychological science. Does anyone remember about how many papers actually uh, met muster and actually proved to be uh, 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 replicated? 30%. 40%. Yeah. It was between 30 and 40 percent. Oh, brother. Uh, so to me, that's a research design problem. That means that the, the study was faulty in some way or another from a research design and a subject acquisition, subject assessment uh, standpoint. That's what that tells me. So uh, uh, we, we've, got to do, we've got to do a better job. And yes, um, how much uh, has occurred in the last decade uh, with scientific fraud? Well, that's also part of the problem to uh, publish and uh, uh, get things uh, out there. So it, it, is a, it is a huge problem, and it sort of depends on the institution and, and the kind of pressure that the institution uh, applies for um, advancement and uh, all of those kinds of things. It, it's a very significant issue. Yes. Yeah, in terms of treatment, uh, this distinction between mental health and brain health, you can see how it gets back to research, especially you have questions, but how does it, what does it imply for, for treatment? Make people better? So uh, I think that's the, that's the whole goal is to make them uh, better. Some of it uh, from the standpoint of just, for example, what's going on right now from the military standpoint, from suicide and from uh, these war fighters and veterans and soldiers uh, coming forth and identifying that there's a problem. There's still a stigma associated with mental health. It's still viewed, I can, I can tell you because I've worked with these people, it's still viewed as a weakness in character. It, that, that's just a matter of fact. I can tell you from the standpoint of working with patients that have traumatic brain injury, if I can show them an abnormality or something that's in their brain. It helps them appreciate what has actually happened. Um, and it gives them maybe some better insight. Um, how we can actually use this then to direct uh, therapies. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm very interested in mindfulness at this point in time. I think mindfulness is, a, is a potentially a very beneficial uh, therapeutic technique. Um, we don't really know what mindfulness is doing from a brain standpoint, but it might be very, think of it from this perspective, from a treatment standpoint, if we took this from a brain health perspective. And let's, uh, there's Bill. <laughs> How are you doing? So, uh, so if, if, we, if we look at this from a treatment perspective, and let's say we have this ideal situation where the University of Montana has a 
MR scanner. And let's say that I have a patient who is, who, who's experienced a mild traumatic brain injury and is very anxious and is having great difficulty coping and is very stressed out. And let's say I do an analysis and I see that the activation pattern in that patient's uh, amygdala seems to be out of whack. I can get a baseline. I can do various interventions that, including mindfulness, including some kind of relaxation therapy, uh, doing, do something with this person to help them cope better. I can put them back in the scanner and see if I've actually improved that brain system. Right now, what do we do? So Dr. Patnow, who's there. So you have to rely on your patient to tell you whether they're better or not, right? Do you know if their brain has changed? Don't know. We have no metric to know if we've actually done something. Let me show you, let me just throw up this. Okay, so here's this diffusion tensor uh, scan. So if, if we were to know where a particular region, you know what, there's a better slide here. Um, bear with me for just one moment. It was the network slide that I was showing here at the end. Yeah, this one. Okay. So, this right here, this is what I was talking about. So this is the uncinate fasciculus right here. This is this very quick pathway which is absolutely critical in emotional arousal. Do you have earthquakes around here? Okay. So, not, like Cali so, so not like California and uh, where BYU is. BYU is actually built on the Wasatch Fault. And uh, we have training that we go through for uh, the big earthquake that's going to hit us. Well, if this building started to shake right now and it felt like an earthquake, you got to have instantaneous alertness, activation, arousal, and then you have to be processing what is it that I'm going to do to get out of here. So the classic flight, fight reaction. The immediate arousal reaction is because this uncinate fasciculus is connected to the inferior frontal area. This is a fast track, it's very short, and it's also connected to the reticular activating system of the brainstem. So it happens like that. But these long coursing decision making pathways like this here that are six or seven inches long, those are slow pathways. So, uh, but what we can now do is we can do what's called seed this area here and seed this area here, and we can tell the integrity of these pathways all the way from the amygdala to the inferior frontal uh, area. And we can tell whether they're healthy or not. So if we had some emotional probes that we could use that told us something about how this person was functioning, and then we looked at this area here using DTI, we might be able to find out some very interesting things that could tell us something about how this emotional center of the brain is actually functioning. Uh, additionally, see this right here? This, these are different networks. I just didn't have time. Just about every slide here is worth a week or two lecture. Uh, so there's just not enough time. But um, so this right here, is referred to as the frontal parietal network. So there are regions in the parietal lobe uh, that are uh, important for the frontal parietal network and then this large area uh, here in the medial uh, uh, frontal lobe. But uh-oh, there's also an area in the temporal lobe. These areas all have to be connected. Well, using structural imaging, so like if, if think of this right here, so here's temporal, 
here's parietal, here's frontal lobe. I can seed this area here, and depending on where I uh, draw those boundaries, I can measure every projection out of there and every projection in there. And then I can select an area here, and I can select an area here, and I can triangulate those pathways. So if I have a patient that has a problem with attention concentration and executive control, that's what I should do. I should analyze that brain to see how healthy that network is. And if that, help, if that network is not healthy, then I should see either a workaround or a way to compensate or maybe something else that can be done. And I know that is my cue. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you.